Free the Children, a young man fights against child labor and proves that children can change the world by Craig Kilberger with Kevin Major. Part one, prologue. The room broke into thunderous applause as he climbed out of the stool behind the podium. He was a mere four foot two, but his presence filled the room. His name was Iqbal Masi, a freed child laborer, a champion fighter for the freedom of his peers. And he'd come to the U.S. from Pakistan to receive the Reebok Youth in Action Award in recognition of his courage in exposing the horrors of child labor. As Iqbal turned to the microphone, young children craned their necks to see him more clearly. His small frame made him look no older than some of them. For many in the audience, it was hard to imagine him as a powerful activist for human rights. The story Iqbal told was not unlike that of many children in South Asia sold into bondage as a result of loans taken out by poor families. Iqbal's parents, to pay for the wedding of their eldest son, had borrowed 600 rupees, about 12 US dollars, from the owner of a carpet factory, a rich and influential man in the community. In exchange, Iqbal, said to be only four years old at the time, was forced to join several other child weavers, squatting before looms in the owner's factory tying tiny knots to make the carpets of elaborate design that sell for high prices in markets around the world. Until his family's loan, called the Peshki, was paid off, Iqbal would belong to the factory owner. The man had not only the right to Iqbal's labor, but also, if he wished, the right to sell him to any other factory owner. Iqbal's days were long. He worked from early morning until seven at night, 12 hours a day, six days a week. He learned quickly not to bring on the wrath of the factory owner. If he made mistakes, fines were added to the sum owed by his parents. He worked with the threat of getting a beating or having his legs tied together and being hung upside down in a back room. Many of the children had scars on their hands and feet where they had been whipped or struck with sticks or sharp metal tools for falling asleep at the loom. Often too, they cut themselves accidentally with the carpet knives especially when first learning the trade. The foreman would dip the wounds into hot oil to stop the bleeding or fill the cuts with matchstick powder and set them on fire so the skin and blood would bond together quickly. Then the children would be sent back to work. When Iqbal was 10 years old, he realized he would never be able to pay off his family's debt and, like many others in the village, would remain a slave forever. The debt had increased to 13,000 rupees the fines for his mistakes, and the charges for the bowl of rice he ate each day. With the help of a human rights organization, Iqbal was able to escape and go to school. He completed two grade levels that first year. He learned to read and write, and he became an uncompromising critic of child servitude, leading child workers into many marches to protest this exploitive practice. He developed into an eloquent and powerful speaker. He traveled to places very distant from his home. In the spring of 1994, Iqbal spoke at a press conference in Stockholm, Sweden, organized by the Swedish Industrial Union. Now I'm not scared of the factory owner, Iqbal told the reporters. He is scared of me. Later that year, he arrived in Boston to receive the Reebok Youth in Action Award. Holding a pencil in one hand and a carpet tool in the other, Iqbal stood before the audience, and in his small but commanding voice, he spoke of the horrors of child labor. The room was intensely silent. We have a slogan at school, Iqbal said. When children get free, we all together say, we are free, we are free. By this time, the audience had risen to its feet. We are, came his voice, filling the room. Free, shouted the crowd. We are, Iqbal called again. Free, bowed the well-dressed men and women and their well-fed young children. Iqbal's dream was to become a lawyer and help more children in his country gain their freedom. Inspired by his courage, Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts offered him a full scholarship for when he finished his schooling in Pakistan. A representative from Reebok sent up an appointment with an American doctor to provide Iqbal with a year's supply of hormones to improve his stunted growth. He 
His future looked bright, and millions of child laborers now had a spokesperson. But on Easter Sunday, April 16, 1995, four months after Iqbal's trip to the United States, tragedy struck. Iqbal had taken the bus from Lahore to visit his family in Marik. He spent most of his day with his mother, his half-brother, and his younger sister. He proudly showed them his report card from school. Then, at 7 o'clock that evening, he left by bus to return to Lahore. Two cousins from his boarded the bus at the same time to return to their own home a short distance from Marik. When the cousins got off the bus, Iqbal decided to go with them to visit his uncle, who he hadn't seen in some time. When the boys reached the uncle's home, they discovered he was working in the fields. They headed off by bicycle in search of him. All three rode on the same bicycle, one on the carrier in the back, another pedaling, Iqbal settling on the front handlebars. On the deserted stretch of land leading to the fields, there was a rough, seldom-traveled road. From out of the dark came a blast from a 12-bore, double-barreled shotgun. One of his cousins was struck in the arm. Iqbal fell dead. The next day, Iqbal's body was placed on a funeral platform and carried through his village. A white headdress surrounded his face. A bright red blanket covered his body. A large cross lay beside him, a symbol of his Christian faith. Death, in dreadful contrast to the jostling stream of people through the streets, had taken Iqbal. The voice of freedom from child labor was silenced. One young girl, Shanaz, who had been forced into bonded labor in a brick kiln, looked on and declared, The day Iqbal died, a thousand new Iqbals were born. Part 2. Lahore We met Iqbal's mother, Inayat Bibi, and his sister, Sobia, in a heavily guarded compound in Lahore. Inayat Bibi's accommodation was sparse, no more than a converted storage room, with a few scraps of furniture. I sat on a bench on one side, opposite Iqbal's mother and a translator from the BLLF. About her head, she wore a multicolored cotton shawl. She stared ahead most of the time, speaking only when the BLLF official asked her a question. Sometimes she raised the shawl to her eyes to wipe away tears. The translator was neatly dressed in traditional Pakistani clothing, but with a Western style jacket and gray star scarf. He seemed to constantly have a cigarette between his fingers. Behind him stood another person from the BLLF. He videotyped our entire meeting. I looked across at Iqbal's mother and smiled, hoping to ease her discomfort. I realized it would probably be the only opportunity I would ever have to speak with her. Why do you think your son was killed? I asked. She spoke quietly. She is telling that Iqbal had some enemy by carpet owner the translator said, and she thinks that the carpet owner and her husband are involved in this. I had heard how Iqbal's father was now living with his stepdaughter in another village. I'd also been told that he was a drug addict. The Bonded Labor Liberation Front and Iqbal's mother maintained that Iqbal's father was paid off to publicly support the police story and to denounce Khan and the BLLF. Iqbal's mother looked away. It seemed to me that she didn't want to talk about it any further. I thought I'd try to pinpoint Iqbal's age, but like so many others I had met who had never learned to read or write, she wasn't entirely certain of anyone's age, not even that of her own children. Many times during my trip, I'd asked children how old they were and at what age they'd started to work. And they would hold up a hand to indicate a certain height, unaware of their actual age. I decided to t try a different tack. How old was Iqbal when he was sold into bondage? Six years. I did a quick mental calculation. Everyone seemed to agree that Iqbal had started working for his last boss, Arshad, in 1986. If he was six years old at the time, that would place his age at the time of his death at 14 or 15 years old. According to the report of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, Iqbal's mother had said that he was 15 or 16 when he died. I was beginning to realize that when Iqbal was murdered, he had to be older than 12, the age Khan had given the international press. 
how much older was still a mystery. I worried about other things that had been reported by the international press. Was he literally locked up with chains? No, without chains, she said. So he could come home every night, I asked. His mother nodded. Yes, every night he can come, the translator said, because the factory was situated near her home. It was said that Iqbal sometimes worked from four o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night, 15 hours a day. I thought of how exhausted he must have been at night, even if he were allowed to come home. I asked Iqbal's mother some more questions. Then for a moment, I looked at her sad eyes. They seemed to be so distant, so filled with pain. It was time to talk about happier days, I thought. Can you tell about some of your fonder memories of Iqbal's life? Iqbal was very fond of cooking, the translator related to me, and spending time with his sister, Sobia. I nodded. If Iqbal were alive today, what do you think he would say to young people in Canada and around the world? She is telling, the translator said, that Iqbal released about 300 children from bondage, and his message was that child labor should be finished all over the world. Many times he told about the importance of education of the children for all young people all over the world. If there was one message to take back with me to Canada from Pakistan, it was this. When Iqbal's mother had finished, she stood up. The two cousins, Faryad and Leakut, who rolled with Iqbal into the night of his murder, came into the room. They were big, much taller and broader than I was, especially Faryad, who had the beginning of a beard. The two of them sat down where Iqbal's mother had been. She moved down to the bench with me. I said to the translator, can they tell me a little about the story about how they were with Iqbal when he died? The boys answered. They were taking food for the uncle. They were riding their bicycle and singing, and suddenly someone fired at them, the translator said. When the gun fired, Faryad was also wounded, and he fainted at that point. When he came to his senses, he saw many people around him, like the landowner and the police inspector. Perhaps, I thought, Leakut would be able to provide some insight into what happened, since he was the only one not hit. Can he explain a little of what happened after the shot was fired? Leakut's answer caused the translator to raise his voice slightly at him. Iqbal's mother broke in briefly, and she too raised her voice at Leakut. It was as if he had not given the answer they wanted to hear. He was crying and he was confused, said the translator. I knew it could not have been all that Leakut had said, but we had no way of probing further. Then what happened? I asked. They were taken to the police station. They put their thumbs on a blank sheet of paper and were told to leave. Alam asked if he could videotape the wounds that Faryad had received from the gunshot. Faryad raised his, his sleeve to show the inside of his left arm. I looked at scars from six pellet wounds, running from above his elbow to his hand. My heart sank. It seemed that he had really been shot, but now something else just didn't make sense. On what side was Iqbal hit? I asked the translator. On his right side, in the back, he replied, running his hand up to the back of his right leg, from the back of his right leg to his shoulder. The autopsy report given at the Judicial Commission of the High Court of Lahore had said the same thing. But if Faryad was sitting on the bicycle behind Iqbal when they were riding, how could it be that Faryad had pellets in his left arm and not his right side, like Iqbal? And how could it be that Iqbal was shot in the back at all if he was indeed, indeed sitting on the front of the bike with his two cousins behind him? Would his cousins not have been a shield and taken the brunt of the pellets, especially since they were so much bigger than Iqbal? And what had happened to the bicycle, which might have shed some light on the shooting? The police had never collected this vital piece of evidence. It seemed that for every answer I received, two more questions were raised. I wondered how many people had been paid off. I thought about how easy it was to control desperately poor people who had few alternatives for survival. So many people had their own agendas, their own reasons for lying about Iqbal Masi. Alam and I packed our luggage and took a flight to Delhi. 
en route to Madras. In the end, there were only two things I knew for certain. The Iqbal Masih died on the evening of April 6, 1995, as a result of gunshot wounds, and that Iqbal had been able to lift himself out of the cycle of bondage and bring a voice to the silenced. I realized something else. It didn't matter if Iqbal was 19 or if he was 12 when he was murdered. It didn't matter whether he was killed by local carpet manufacturers who, whose factories he was forcing to close, or by local jealousy because he was a Christian child traveling and getting an education, or by the man known as Ashraf. All that mattered was his work was still not over and that we were challenged to continue it. In his life and in his death, he moved the hearts of those who heard his story. That will never be in doubt. As the plane continued towards Delhi, I looked over at his alam in the seat next to me. He had fallen asleep, exhausted. So was I. Keeping me awake were images of Pakistan, the graveyard, Iqbal's mother, the cluttered offices, a brick kiln. I wondered what Iqbal would have said about the brick kiln. On our second day in Lahore, we had traveled a couple of hours outside the city to visit a brick kiln. I was uncertain what to expect. A place for making bricks, obviously, with hot ovens, perhaps. What we came upon was a world unto itself. A landscape of reddish-brown clay molded into a small town, a huge smokestack at its center, sucking in oxygen and spewing out thick smoke. Its people worked the clay from dusk into dawn until dusk, preparing it to be shipped away in heavy trucks, their only contact with the outside world. The people lived entirely in labor. They started young, eight years old, and even younger sometimes. It was natural to be helping, since they'd played in the clay since they were old enough to crawl. The help turned to work, like that of their brothers and sisters and their parents and grandparents. They would spend a lifetime at the same endless tasks, chopping clay from the open pit, shoveling it onto wheelbarrows, dumping it into a pile, mixing it with water, slapping it into molds, churning out bricks, stacking them into wheelbarrows, pushing them to the kiln, lowering them inside, stoking the fires, loading the cool bricks aboard the trucks, day after day for a lifetime. I tried my hand at molding one. At the rate you work, the boy had said next to me, laughing, you won't eat tonight. School, I had asked him. Would you like to go to school? What's school? What is it like? What do people do there? What do you hope for the future? I said. I will do the same job. I will work to pay the debt. I will work to eat. One day I will take a loan from the owner. My children will have to pay. He had never been off the site of the brick kiln. One day, perhaps, he would get to ride on the truck, to go to Lahore to help unload the bricks. What freedom that would be. As I thought back to the brick kiln, my mind wandered from the boy to Iqbal. Then again, back to the boy. Perhaps the bricks that outlined Iqbal's grave had been made by that boy. Iqbal knew what freedom was. He'd showed it to the others. We are free. And one day, that boy like Iqbal must shout it too. That was the real power of Iqbal.